In this video I'm going to show you a great game built on a terrible foundation. I'll show you how you can spend £20 to condense six months worth of free to play farming into three minutes and how even if you do buy the 30 day item pack you might not actually get the 30 day item pack. I'll show you the secret mathematical and psychological tricks the game uses to get you to spend money including abusive pricing structures, multiple layers of RNG and the 22 different in-game currencies. I'll explain how Diablo Immortal has got around the legal definition of loot box by adding in a single gameplay step despite being functionally the same process. I'll explain how Diablo Immortal is essentially a gacha game and has hidden whale mechanics you can't even find until you've invested enough money that they are sure they've got you. And then I'll lament over how if you removed all of this it's actually a very good game. Let's start with the basics. Video game critique, especially on the internet, can be a difficult thing to balance. Fans of any game want you to praise it and can become angered when you point out flaws. And people who dislike the game love it when you point out flaws and hate it when you praise it. This is because video game communities contain very passionate people both for and against any game or company and both extreme sides are often reading reviews or watching videos looking for confirmation bias, not actual critique. Most people want to be told what they already strongly believe is correct. The for and against Diablo Immortal camps have already sprung up, with some people focusing on the absurd cash shop and others saying, you don't need to pay, it's a free game, just don't spend any money. The cash shop critics point out the blatant pay for advantage systems and daily login rewards encouraging addictive gameplay patterns, along with the loot box style gameplay so egregious it's already been preemptively banned in two countries for falling foul of the EU gambling laws, and the game supporters reply with a well rehearsed, well I'm having fun, it's it hasn't affected me. I'll be discussing the damage this general attitude is doing to the gaming industry as a whole later. The truth is Diablo Immortal is an excellent gameplay experience with solid moment to moment combat and super enjoyable hack and slash multiplayer moments absolutely overshadowed by a foundation level insidious monetization system designed to make every aspect of the game funnel the player towards spending an absolutely unacceptable amount of money. But this goes deeper than just one game. So in this video I'll not only deeply critique Diablo Immortal but also the behaviours of an industry industry and how we as players can set the boundaries for what we will and will not accept in relation to monetization. I'll show you the deep psychological and mathematical tricks games companies are using to turn video games from products you purchase and enjoy because they're designed to be fun into processes they want you to become stuck within and then keep paying for because they're designed to be inviting and then addictive. I'll also be contrasting the design decisions within Diablo Immortal to Blizzard's own code of conduct and ethics on their own website. And we'll see if Diablo Immortal as a game lives up to Blizzard's own self-imposed standards. Grab a drink because this is quite a long video. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm Josh Streifhays, and today we're going to look at the diabolically immoral Diablo Immortal. A big thank you to all the supporters on Patreon and Twitch who allow me to remain independent and make videos like this. I'll be looking at the general gameplay, plot and combat, then into the absolute plethora of monetization tricks the game uses, including gentle onboarding, limited time offers causing fear of missing out, abusive pricing structures, multiple steps of conversion, multiple stacking monthly subs, cumulative login days being required for paid for rewards, multiple progression tracks, and just straight up locking the main aspect Diablo is known for, dopamine spiking loot fountains shooting out of a boss, behind a paywall. Now Diablo as a franchise is no stranger to monetization controversy. When Diablo 3 released it had an actual money in-game marketplace. Players could sell their drops or buy drops from other players for actual cash. This was removed relatively quickly after extreme community backlash. As players pointed out it was against the spirit of Diablo. The end game gameplay of Diablo revolves around repeatedly killing high intensity bosses as they increase in difficulty for the chance of a rare drop. If you could just buy the rare drop you'd be defeating the main gameplay loop and removing the sense of pride and accomplishment which comes with having those rare drops. Diablo 3 released on PC and console in May of 2012 and six years later in 2018 at BlizzCon players were excited to hear news about Diablo 4 but what they got was Diablo Immortal, a mobile game and that gave us this absolute classic moment in gaming history. Is there any plans to make this playable on PC or is this just strictly mobile forever? Uh, are there any, uh, yeah, this, this, the current plan is to be on mobile, both uh, Android and iOS. Uh, we don't have any plans at the moment to do uh, PC.
Do you guys not have phones? Yeah, you guys all have. I think it's important to realize BlizzCon is attended by Blizzard's biggest fans, mostly PC gamers. Warcraft, World of Warcraft, Starcraft, Diablo, and Overwatch have massive PC player bases, so very few of these people were actively excited about a mobile game. The people in that room wanted a game which would push their hardcore gaming PCs to the max and not be full of traditional mobile microtransactions and time-gating mechanics. In June of 2022, Diablo Immortal released on mobile and went into open beta on PC. The PC version is a port of the mobile game and still features such lines as tap to play. The game does feature cross-platform play, so mobile and PC players can adventure together, provided they're on the same server because it does not have cross-server play. So I downloaded the game on PC and gave it a go. The first warning cry from everyone said, The game can track your face through your phone app or your webcam. Now this rumour began when the installation files were opened up and people found Face Detector and Face Analyzer.dll. Some people said the game has face tracking capabilities because it's required for release in China to conform to the strict gaming laws. However, the lead dev Adam Fletcher explains they're actually leftover files from an early idea in Diablo Immortals development. Originally, the game would let you recreate your own facial expression on your character by using your own camera. This idea has been abandoned because it was terrible. The intro movie plays, Tyrael talks about the world stone, some greater evil, and then we get this absolute banger of a line. If humanity is to survive, they must stand together and face the rising darkness. I find it beautifully ironic that Diablo Immortal opens with a call for players to rally together against a rising evil and the main thing it's inspired people to do is come together against its atrocious pricing model. What a meta way to succeed. Get told to tap the screen because porting mobile games to PC is hard and then choose a class. Six classes, I'm going with my edgy boy, the Demon Hunter. The customization is actually really nice. We move some sliders. Unfortunately, these do not matter at all because you'll never look at your own face or any other character's face. We're then on a boat to worth them. The game is fully voiced and it's not terribly acted. <laughs> Gone to hell, you say? I'm in the right place then. Aye. Follow the road and be on your guard. Unfortunate things happen to travellers in that forest. Movement is WASD or left click. Primary attacking is also left click, but you'll only attack when your cursor is over an enemy. This can mean clicking to move, especially in a crowd of enemies, is a bad idea because you'll end up attacking instead of moving. It also means you'll frequently lose your cursor in the chaos of battle and end up randomly running around or attacking off to the side somewhere while you try and find it again. It also means once you've killed whatever it was you were attacking, if you continue holding down left click, you'll start running toward that location. Your other skills are bound to the 2, 3 and 4 keys. We'll look at combat later because honestly, it's great. If you've never played a Diablo game, here's a basic rundown. Demons exist and you'd really rather they didn't. You can realise your dream of a demon-free world through the power of friendship and incredible violence. Eventually angels get involved, but the power of heaven is nothing compared to the power of one angry man with an axe or a moody guy with some crossbows. One thing I do have to praise the game for is capturing the feeling of Diablo while being made in a completely different engine. Diablo 3 was created in a customised version of the Havoc engine, while Diablo Immortal is made in NetEase's own Messiah engine. They've managed to capture the feeling of movement, skill use and attack impact spot on. Kill enemies and pick up loot. Annoying, you can't click on an item's nameplate, you have to click on the item itself. Your inventory is the classic Diablo style of a square grid with larger items taking up multiple grid slots. As you fight on, enemies will drop red health orbs or blue mana orbs, sometimes power-up orbs like increased speed or lightning damage. Along with this you have three health potions which recharge when you kill enemies. This game design lends itself to fast aggressive combat encountered because you are rewarded for being aggressive so the energy is always high. We make our way to the town of Wortham, get followed through a portal by some demon and told... Trust me, mate, once I explain the monetization, you definitely will. We head into the chapel and meet our old friend Deckard Kane, so we decide to stay a while and listen. My name is Deckard Kane. I'm a bit of a traveling scholar, one might say. 
basically hell's coming back and we're going to prevent it with the power of crossbows. Fight some cultists to the west and discover sometimes the left mouse button gets stuck down, even if you're not clicking, making your character follow the cursor, and other times it just doesn't register. Possibly lag, but honestly in two days of near constant play, I didn't experience that many connection issues. Kill a dragon thing and find a shard of the world stone, magical MacGuffins hell really wants and we need to destroy. Think of them like demonic batteries, and like regular batteries, you shouldn't throw them in the regular bin, so we're on a quest to find a responsible way to dispose of them. Kane tells us the demon we're fighting is called Skarn. This means we're now at threat level midnight, so we set off to destroy more of the shards of the world stone before hell can plug them into more demons. Quick intro video explains the map and we're sent off to help someone with something and the game asks, hey, wanna spend 89p for some orbs and a weapon skin? I'm gonna keep track of every time the game gives me the opportunity to spend money. This is the first, and I'm gonna do a deep dive into the currencies and the systems they relate to later on in this video. Once you have a few quests, you'll get the quest list on the left. Click on a quest to select it, and you'll see a sparkling footstep path leading you to it. If you're far enough into an area, you'll unlock auto-navigation within that area. Using auto-navigate will either run or automatically teleport you to the nearest teleport point and then run the rest of the way. I also discover the first kill of the day award so let's rip this band-aid off right now. Diablo Immortal is a mobile game and is designed to build habits, to create attachment and to encourage daily replay. You have an oppressive number of tracked systems, login rewards, first kill awards, advancement paths, some free, some paid, some upgradable. You have achievements and advancements through every single zone and rewards for killing enough monsters and doing enough dungeons and each of these systems is tracked on a different screen with a different UI and it's made this way by design. You're not meant to be able to remember everything you have to do, so the game can give you these little red gem icons to the top right of buttons to remind you you have something to collect, and you'll often find yourself spending more time in endless menus collecting rewards than you will in an actual rift. We chase down some mage, we watch her throw a dude off a bridge, and then meet this guard who says this. Oh, what a day. Certainly didn't expect to get choked by some death mage when I left the stead this morning. None of us wake up expecting to be choked by a death mage, but sometimes you just get lucky and it happens. To interact with another player, hold alt and left click on them. You can send messages, friend requests and party invitations, but you cannot directly trade player to player because trading is done via the auction house and requires the premium currency of platinum to do. Quick PC issue. This is the salvage menu where you turn your unwanted equipment into scrap. The mouse wheel does not move this window. You need to click and drag. If you're going to release on PC, please let us use the scroll wheel. Also consider using right click, because as it stands, right click does absolutely nothing. A free daily reward pack accessed via the shop menu. This is a psychological marketing trick. If you're going to give the player something for free, make sure to claim it. They have to access a place where they there is paid stuff, because then they will see the paid stuff every day, and if they're returning to this screen for their free daily pack, it's only a matter of time until someone gets tempted to spend money. You're not putting this free pack here because it makes logistical sense, you're putting it here because it's tempting. I then get a free cosmetic set sent to me in the mail. Everyone gets this. It's to celebrate 30 million pre-registrations. 30 million pre-registrations. If you ever wonder why mobile games are so pushed, it's because the horrible truth is the mobile gaming market is bigger than the PC and console gaming market combined. As you progress through the main story, you'll unlock bounties, an open world hunting system. Hunt down certain enemies and get increased rewards for killing them. You can claim eight bounties a day from the bounty board. My current bounty target is Philip, so the plan is grab mum, kill Phil, go to the Winchester, have a nice cold pint and wait for all this to blow over. I'm picking up new equipment every few minutes, and on the inventory screen there's a handy dandy green arrow showing you if a new piece is better than an old piece. Many people will tell you that Diablo begins at 60, because until then you'll be finding upgrades so quickly you won't even read the name or look at the stats of any individual bit. You'll just do as the green arrow commands. But if you're a free player, I would argue the real game begins around level 35 when the leveling suddenly slows to a crawl, but we'll see more of that later. I unlock the extremely awesome grapple skill, letting me blast around the battlefield like a more vital 
silent Spider-Man and Global Chat has descended into an argument about pay-to-win versus free-to-play, so while I'm madly grappling around, let me make my stance on this game rather clear. No one has said they expect this game to be 100% free. No one expects any video game to have no way to make money whatsoever. Indeed, if it was a one-time paid game with a cosmetic-only cash shop, I'd be recommending this to everyone. No one has an issue with Diablo Immortal attempting to make money. We know that development time and server hosting costs money. The issue I have is the way it is making it and the position it is putting players into if they don't pay. The game is not a product because a product is usually released finished and then sold for the cost the company think it is worth. If that cost is fair, people will pay it and then that process is complete. Diablo Immortal is a process itself of downloading, playing and advancing and it wants players to stay within that process as long as possible because unlike a product which is sold once, a process can contain many moments it encourages the player to pay. And each individual payment may only be small, but they very quickly add up to greater than the cost of a one-time purchase. When I talk about the payment issues, people respond with a well-rehearsed retort of, well, I'm having fun. And I think it's vital if you do respond with, well, I'm having fun. Good. We are all glad. No one wants you to stop having fun. What we want is the company to treat you better. If your attitude is, I don't care about the money, I'm just focusing on the game, then please understand we're actually advocating for the company to have the same attitude as you. Focus on making the game as fun as it can be and people will buy it because it's fun. Not because you've designed it to be as close to fun as possible so it keeps players around, but not too much fun that they can enjoy it completely without paying. Blizzard's first What We Stand For is Gameplay First, which literally says to make Make our games as fun as possible. We're not saying Diablo Immortal shouldn't be monetized. We're saying it shouldn't be abusively monetized. We push on and go and kill Leoric because it's not a real Diablo game until you've killed Leoric. During this part, I unlock the Battle Pass and the Boon of Plenty in the shop. And when I finish the Leoric dungeon, I'm presented with the exciting opportunity to spend more money to buy the Mad King's Breach bundle a one-time reward specific to this dungeon. Your reward for finishing a dungeon is the opportunity to spend money. This happens in every dungeon, and you'll notice the costs of the pack slowly increase. Because it's only 89p when you finish one dungeon, that's fine. But once you've spent 89p, you're invested. Which means they can make things more and more expensive until they stop giving you any real discount for buying the dungeon packs. But you're still doing it, because by then, not buying it would be wasting the money you've previously spent. This is effectively the sunk cost fallacy. Twitter user MrGM made this mock-up of a picture. Just imagine if finishing a dungeon for the first time in World of Warcraft rewarded you with the opportunity to spend money to unlock extra rewards. I'm going to come back to this later and fully explain the Battle Pass and Boon of Plenty because when you read the fine print it is even worse than it seems. The demon effect under the glass floor, however, is awesome and the boss fight itself is great. More story, we kill Lethes, but not really. Who's Lethes, you ask? No one cares, doesn't matter. The story in a Diablo game is background music, it's set dressing. Many times you'll be introduced to a character, go on a quest with them, then watch them die in a heart-wrenching hero's death. They'll sacrifice themselves for a greater cause. And you're expected to care, and I'm thinking, mate, I've known you ten minutes. The only reason I remember your name is because it's above your head while you're dying. We now unlock legendary gem crafting, and this is the system we'll be pouring most of our wallet into later. We now learn about sockets, gems, elder rifts, and crests, so this this is probably the time to talk about the game's main system, the Elder Rifts, and how they're going to cost you an incredible amount of money to do efficiently. In fact, if you complete one rift every five minutes and want the best loot from them, you'll be spending around £240 an hour to grind this game. Let me break that down for you. While Diablo Immortal does have a main campaign storyline, and indeed you are required to finish this to unlock the Hell Plus difficulty in Rifts, the majority of your gameplay, both grinding and post-story, will be in an an Elder Rift. An Elder Rift is a procedurally generated dungeon you can enter solo or in a team of up to four. There is a party finding mechanic, but remember, it's cross-platform play, not cross-server. As we discovered when Callum Upton, a fellow YouTuber and good friend of mine, made a character. 
Currently, there is no way to transfer your character from one server to another. You just need to restart. While in a rift, you'll see a timer to the left. The little hourglass symbol moves along the bar from left to right. As you kill enemies, the bar itself fills up. When the bar is full, the boss will spawn. Kill the boss before the timer runs out. Get the loot, leave and repeat. This is the absolute core of the PvE Diablo experience. Grind enemies for better equipment to grind enemies better. But before you start a rift, you can choose to add in crests, either normal or legendary. Adding crests increases the chance higher rarity loot will drop from the boss kill. You can see the potential loot increase as you add crests. Now, seeing as the crest screen shows three empty slots on the right hand side and shows zero out of three, you'd assume that each player can add up to three crests. Well, no, they can add way more, but it's hidden and we'll come to that later. Loot in Diablo Immortal is personal. No other player can steal your rare or legendary loot. Now, adding in legendary crests as a player always guarantees you a legendary item, but it does also give a slight boost to the other players in your party and increases their chance to receive runestones or fading embers, both intermediate upgrade currencies. This has led to the rather toxic situation of parties kicking players who aren't using crests because they feel those non-cresting players are not paying their way. Way. Using crests always benefits you and sometimes helps the party. You cannot lose your drop potential to another player, but to truly understand the absolute insidious nature of how powerful these legendary crests are and why they are considered pay to win and how much money you can end up spending on them, we need to understand how the other currency systems work because the crests feed into almost everything else. So we need to take a look at the very foundation of the monetization system for context. Now the game itself is a tangled web of to woven systems which all relate to each other and it's designed that way to hide the actual monetary cost of any single system. Because of this spiderweb design it's very difficult to find a starting point so hold on because this might get complicated while I break it down. I have so far experienced in Diablo Immortal 22 different currencies and raw materials used to feed into various shops and upgrade systems. They are Gold, dropped from enemies, used in upgrading equipment. Eternal Orbs, premium buyable currency, used for buying things in the shop. Platinum, used in the market board for posting and buying items player to player, bought with Eternal Orbs. Battle Points, used to progress the battle pass and earn the battle pass rewards, earned by completing rifts, dungeons, or bought directly with Eternal Orbs. Scrap Materials, used to upgrade items earned from salvaging unneeded equipment at the blacksmith. Hilts, spend at the Hilt Merchant on limited monthly or weekly stock, earned by progressing the battle pass. Normal Gems, combined to upgrade non-legendary gems, bought from the Hilt Merchant, found in rifts when using normal crests, and made by combining runes at the Apprentice Jewelers. Runes, dropped in rifts when you are using crests or someone in your party is using a legendary crest. I have so far found 21 different runes. Garnet, Sapphire and Beryl, three gems which all combine to upgrade the Legacy of the Haradrim, a system which you unlock once you're level 49 and have completed 10 challenge rifts. Crests, improve rift drops slightly. You get one free a day bought from the Hilt Merchant, sometimes earned on the Battle Pass. Legendary Crests, improve rift drops by a lot and guarantee a legendary. Bought from the cash shop for orbs or found in the premium shop dungeon chest unlocked after you finish that dungeon. You can also buy one a month from the hilt merchant using in-game currency or earn two on the battle pass. The Sigil of Dominance advances your immortal standing, a higher level endgame faction. Enchanted Dust, an upgrade material used on higher level item upgrades found by salvaging rare equipment. Reinforcing Stones, re-rolling attributes on equipment bought in the cash shop. Aspirant's Keys, unlock rare chests in dungeons earnable on the battle pass. Scoria, found when fighting Heliquary Demons and refined into Hellfire Scoria at the Blacksmith. Hellfire Scoria upgrades the Heliquary, a repository of demonic power you add to by defeating demons and provides you passive buffs. Legendary Gem Fragments, which combine into legendary gems found in rifts when crests are used and also sometimes on the battle pass. Enigmatic Crystals upgrades your secondary slot items found in challenge rifts and bought from the materials vendor for scrap pieces. Monster Essence upgrades the Haradric Altar dropped by monsters in the overworld randomly. Fading Embers earned from rifts and used to buy base basic gems at the merchants and echo crystals, bought from the crystal merchant for 500 platinum and used to upgrade runes beyond level 5. So 22 currencies and upgrade materials, most of them linked directly to the progression of the battle pass which itself requires battle points which are farmed most efficiently by completing rifts, so now we can go back and look at legendary crests. 
and this is where it gets both psychologically and mathematically abusive. Legendary crests are sold in the shop for orbs. Orbs are bought in specific pack sizes. A legendary crest costs 160 orbs. The shop sells orbs in packs of 60 or 315. There are higher, but let's look at these for now. 60 is too few, and 315 is only 5 orbs shy of 320, which is how many we need to afford 2 legendary crests. This is by design. When a player opens the shop and they've already committed to buying something, the game doesn't want you to consider how much you're buying, but how much you need for the next efficient purchase, because that's always going to be a much lower number. So a player won't think, I'm buying 315 orbs, they'll think, I'm only 5 orbs short of 2 crests. So they'll look into the larger 899 pack, which has 630 orbs. That may seem like a random number to add, but it's remarkably specific, because 4 legendary crests at 160 orbs each costs 640 orbs, meaning even with that pack you're now 10 short. But that's only 10. You may as well buy the bigger pack, which only costs £22 and gets you 1,650 orbs. A player isn't thinking, I've just bought 1,650. They're thinking, I only need 5, and then I only need 10. And once you've bought the 1,650, wouldn't you know it, there's actually a button on the legendary crest screen to buy 10 crests for 1,600 orbs. Super convenient. It's almost like everything is designed to flow into buying that £22 orb pack, and then spending that on 10 legendary crests. So now you have 10 crests, because you've been able to justify only needing 5, then only needing 10. This is abusive pricing. Now, adding a crest to a rift increases the drops a little, and adding a legendary guarantees a decent drop. The shop even explains, adding a legendary is guaranteed to reward a legendary gem that can be sold on the market. Now, you need platinum for the market, but don't worry about that right now. You've got ten crests. You start a rift and you see three crest slots. This means you'll be able to run three rifts on maxed crests and have one left over, right? Well, no. Because if you do put three legendary crests into those slots, a new option appears. An option you will never find until you do this. It asks, hey, want to add another seven for the maxed enhanced Elder Rift experience? There is no way to even find out that you can add ten legendary crests in-game until you add the first three. And isn't it convenient that 10 crests can be added in a single run, and the orb pack size that's most convenient psychologically was designed to make you buy 10 crests? But what actually happens if you add 10 crests to a run? Callum Upton and myself spent two days playing this game as free players, seeing how far we could progress without spending any money. And at around level 35, the experience required to level up increases sharply. In the first day, I went from level 1 to 40. And in a second day of nothing but endless grinding, I went from 40 to 49. During a stream, after two hours of Elder Rift runs, averaging about five minutes per run and only seeing a few rare items, a viewer donated Callum £20 on the agreement Callum would spend it on 10 legendary crests and use them, just to see the loot difference. Here's a compilation of boss drops without using any crests. This is the average experience a free player will have when they finish a rift. And here's what a boss kill looks like when you have 10 legendary crests active. Right, nothing legendary yet, but um, what the fuck? How many ro- two legendaries, three, what the f- four! <laughs> so what? Oh my god!
The average free player will be able to earn 10 crests in about 5 to 6 months worth of casual play, buying one a month from the Hilt Merchant and earning one from the Free Battle Pass layer. So what you have just seen, using 10 legendary crests on a single run, is essentially 6 months worth of free player legendary crest loot potential condensed into a single chest. Diablo is known for dopamine spiking loot fountains like that. Killing a boss and watching loot explode is quintessential Diablo design, and that exact experience in Diablo Immortal will cost you £20 a time. That rift took us 5 minutes to complete, meaning you can complete about 12 rifts an hour. If you 10 crest every rift at £20 each, you are spending £240 an hour. And even if you were mad enough to do that, you are not guaranteed the drop you actually want, as this streamer discovered spending $5,000 and not ending up with a level 5 legendary gem. Quick update on that, as writing the script and editing these videos takes a few days and that news story has since changed. That streamer has now spent $10,000 and still has no 5-star legendary gem. But it gets even more insidious, because there are laws requiring loot boxes in games to show the odds of any item received in that loot box. What rifts are is essentially just loot boxes with some gameplay before the loot, but that timer means that technically completing a rift does require a base level of skill, and this skill requirement means it's not gambling per se. And because of this very important distinction, Diablo Immortal does not have to list the drop percent chance of any individual item from a boss drop. If you could just put the legendary crests into a box, they would have to tell you. But if you put the crests into a rift attempt, play the rift and then get the box, that single step of intermediate gameplay means they can avoid the loot box label. But if you do fail a rift while the crests are active, those crests are returned to you. You don't lose them, meaning one crest will always ultimately open the effective loot box of a boss kill. Now, it might seem a little bit strange to be able to put one, two, three, or ten crests in. It's quite the jump, but the ten pull is a common trope in gacha games. Being able to draw one or draw ten from a random gacha chance game is a classic design choice. It can actually help to think of Diablo Immortal as a gacha game. They've just replaced the animation of the opening of the box with five minutes worth of gameplay to really enhance the tension of that drop. Legendary crests are effectively keys to loot boxes. The rift itself is the process of getting to the loot box, and this process means it doesn't have to show you the drop rates. But we're not even close to the final level of monetization, and it's hidden in the awful fine print. Finishing a rift gets you battle points, and these unlock the battle pass system. This is a linear track with rewards unlocked as you advance through it. There are two layers to this track advancing simultaneously, the free and the empowered. Both run at the same time, so whenever you unlock a free reward, you're reminded of what's waiting for you if you were empowered. Unlocking the empowered track costs $4.99 and comes with some cosmetics, or you can go for the collector's empowered unlock and get not only cosmetics, but instantly boost 10 ranks ahead of where you are. Now, the developers have repeatedly said you cannot buy power or items in Diablo Immortal directly. This is because you have to buy orbs and then use the orbs to buy crests and then run rifts with the crests to get the drops. There are steps between money and item, and this is how they justify it. However, buying the Empowered Collector's Battle Pass costs £13 and boosts you 10 ranks along. Now, the rank 10 reward is a legendary offhand weapon. So how is this not paying for equipment? Well, because the legendary offhand weapon is the free track reward. You can pay to boost to get it instantly, but they will argue that's not what you're paying for. That's the free player reward too. But you still have to play the game to gain the battle orbs from rifts and dungeons to level up the battle pass, right? Well, no. If you click rank up, you can just spend orbs to instantly boost your battle pass to maximum. 
unlocking all the rewards instantly. I've managed to grind to Battle Pass rank 13 for free with 27 ranks left to go. Boosting to maximum would cost me 4,050 orbs, meaning I'd still need to spend over 65 pounds on orbs to skip the grind. And remember, all of this is Battle Pass Season 1. So if you aren't able to finish the Battle Pass legitimately before Season 2 releases, you might be tempted to pay real money to boost to get the final rewards, and when the second season comes out, get ready to unlock and pay to skip again. But the Battle Pass isn't the only paid-for progression system. There is a worse one. This is the boon of plenty. This advertises itself as a 30-day membership with daily login rewards and some mechanical boosts such as more inventory slots and being able to access the market board from anywhere. It costs $8.99, but what I'm interested in is the way the login rewards are distributed. The Boon of Plenty says that you get these total rewards over 30 days. But let's read the fine print and see how it actually works. The Boon of Plenty can be purchased multiple times, stacking up to 90 days of daily gifts. Daily gifts can only be claimed while the Boon of Plenty is active, otherwise they will be lost. So if you have a Boon of Plenty active and you log in every day for seven days, you'll get one regular crest a day for a total of seven. But if you fail to log in for those days and you only log in on the seventh day, you won't have a stack of crests waiting for you. You'll just get the one for that day. The missed days are effectively lost. So paying $8.99 doesn't get you all of this stuff, it gets you the chance to get all of this stuff provided you keep logging in. But here's where it gets super scummy. Extra gifts can be claimed every five cumulative login days. Cumulative login days carry over to the next Boon of Plenty period. And then it gives you a list of which gifts are handed out on cumulative days. A single legendary crest at 5, 10 and 15, a legendary and a legendary gem at 20 and 25, and then two legendary crests at 30. So things aren't evenly spaced. Being given two crests on 30 cumulative login days matters. Because if you miss a login day, you effectively miss that reward and you will lose it until you buy more Boons of Plenty. Think of it like this. If you have a Boon of Plenty active and you log in every day for 30 days, on the 30th day, you'll get two legendary crests. But if you miss a single day in that 30-day period, when you log in and the Boon isn't active, your two legendary crests from the first Boon are held until you log in for one more day. It's not consecutive, it's cumulative, meaning in total. So if you miss a single day in the 30-day period, you now need to buy another 30 days to make the boon active again and continue logging in to add days to the cumulative tracker. Don't think of the boon of plenty as the rewards it shows you. Think of it as you are paying for the privilege for your days to count toward cumulative rewards. You are effectively paying to be involved in a fear of missing out process. When I say Diablo Immortal is not a product to be sold, it is a process to be involved in, this is exactly what I mean. This is why they sell them in sets of three, stacking up to 90 days. Because they know people will miss a day, and they won't realise, hang on, I've got rewards being held back, until that 90 days is up. This is why they lock two legendary crests on the 30th login day. If you spend $8.99 and then miss a single day, you're now in a position of buy another 30-day boon or lose out on a valuable reward you've been working towards. This is quite simply one of the most abusively designed systems I've ever seen in a game. It is stunningly anti-player. It looks like you pay $8.99 to get these things, when you're actually paying $8.99 for the opportunity to have your login days count toward earning these things. But we are still not done. Once you hit level 45 and have progressed through the main story enough, you'll unlock another reward progression system, the Prodigy's Path. Think of it like another battle pass, but it doesn't have seasons. With the Prodigy's Path system, you gain rewards every five levels. Then when you hit the max level of 60, you'll gain rewards every five Paragon levels up to 85. But just as with the battle pass, there is a free path and then the adjacent paid path. And it costs £18 to unlock the paid paid Prodigy's Path reward side. But we're still not done. There is one final revelation. 
By now, you've probably seen the number $110,000 being thrown around. This is the figure the gaming news wants you to believe that YouTuber Bellular arrived at when he tried to work out how much it will cost to max a Diablo Immortal character, despite the fact he never actually arrived at that figure specifically. He was discussing how much it could potentially cost to max out a character, and the total cost of $100,000 was mentioned as a potential. Bellular himself even tweets out, we talked about a claim a redditor made, you journos picked that up, claimed we said it, and then spread it across the internet. Whatever the final figure actually is, leveling all six of your legendary gems up, because you can only equip one of each type of gem, will take a hell of a lot of reagents. Remember, you need equal level gems to funnel into a single gem to level it up, meaning it does get exponentially more expensive to do. But the absolute worst design choice, the most anti-player design possible in this monetization madness, is that everything, the battle pass, your enhanced membership of it, your progress along it, your legendary gems, your prodigy's path, your membership of that, the Haradric altar, the monstrous essence stash, your platinum for the market board, and your collected gold, the regular crests, and legendary crests, which, remember, cost £20 a time to 10 crest a rift. In fact, every single thing except the abusively priced eternal orbs, all of it is per character, not per account. If you want to have multiple characters, you will be paying for all of this for all of them. And that includes cosmetics. So if you spend £20 to unlock a cosmetic outfit, you only get it on the character you buy it for. All of this has caused players to review bomb the game and drop its Metacritic score down to 0.5, making it Blizzard's lowest rated game of all time. Despite this, it has so far made $6 million in the first few days. So now I've played for a few days and I've looked into the systems behind it, what's the actual verdict? The truth is that two seemingly contradictory things can both be equally valid. Diablo Immortal is an extremely fun game to play. The combat's great, the bosses are flashy. I enjoyed my time playing. The battle system is great, the synergy between the classes is nice, and the set and legendary items affecting your skills makes for a wide selection of viable builds. Running solo is fun, running in a group is super enjoyable. But I am someone with a great deal of self-control when it comes to money. It is indeed fun but it is also insidiously developed from the ground up to funnel every player action toward the cash shop. Someone said to me, just turn your brain off and play. And while I understand the sentiment of enjoy the flashing lights and loud noises, I am someone who enjoys engaging their brain and solving the puzzle of the game, the puzzle of min-maxing, the puzzle of build variety and team composition. I enjoy having to engage my brain to beat a game. But if you do that with Diablo Immortal, you will ask yourself lots of questions, and the answer to every question is the credit card. And if you're still thinking, well, I've been having fun, great, so have I. Your fun is not invalid. No one wants you to stop having fun. We want the game industry to treat you better. We want the game industry to put a little more focus into making the game fun and a little less into making it predatory. I feel it's our responsibility as YouTubers to hold these companies to account and maybe focus on making the game fun, not spending time working out how you can get around the definition of loot box. And if you think Diablo isn't gambling, remember it's already been banned in Belgium and the Netherlands for falling foul of the EU gambling laws. But has Diablo Immortal lived up to the expectations that Blizzard have set for themselves? On Blizzard's website, on the About section, you can find eight What We Stand For sections. The two that I think stand out the most are Gameplay First and Lead Responsibly. In the Gameplay First section, it says, It is our job to make our games as fun as possible for as many people as we can reach. I do not believe Diablo Immortal is designed to be as fun as possible. I believe it's been designed to be as fun as it needs to be to keep people playing and then monetized. The next self-imposed standard is lead responsibly, which at the bottom says, we are committed to making ethical decisions, always keeping our players in mind and setting a strong example of professionalism and excellence at all times. I cannot believe that decisions were made in Diablo Immortal with the players in mind. I believe they were made with the payers in mind. 
Paul Tassi of Forbes writes, Diablo Immortal is ten times worse than Genshin Impact. In the article, he says, even compared to other mobile titles, Diablo Immortal is going above and beyond with its microtransactions in a way that's far, far worse than most other games in this genre. Diablo Immortal is quite simply an excellent gameplay experience destroyed by being completely infested with predatory systems designed to make you spend more money than is acceptable. It is the rotten corpse of Diablo covered in good-looking clothes. It deserves to make money, but not like this. It deserves praise for the good parts, but you cannot ignore its anti-player design. So I do actually agree with Diablo Immortal's opening cutscene. We as players do need to stand together against the rising evil. That rising evil, Diablo, is you. Thank you very much for watching. Another massive thank you to all the supporters on Patreon and Twitch who keep the channel alive. You can support from only £1 a month. Check the video description for links to the Patreon, Twitch, Twitter and our Discord. And as always, have a great day.